Hello, my gentle and of course very modern apes. Today we're going to take a quick look at a new paper which may shed some light on the precursor condition that allowed hominins to evolve efficient bipedal locomotion. There are a dozen hypotheses out there that attempt to propose a model for how bipedalism evolved in the very first hominins to move that way. And not just bipedalism, but terrestrial bipedalism. So walking on two feet on the ground. I've done some videos on the hypotheses that are out there, which you can check out here. But one thing at least most of the ideas seem to agree upon is that we do descend from something that was arboreal, a tree living ape that through some selective means became a bipedal terrestrial ape. At some time in the past, probably 7 million years ago or so, an arboreal ape comes down to the ground and stands up to look for predators or it comes down to the ground and stands up so that it can carry more resources and provision its mate, or it comes down to the ground and stands up because it's simply more efficient to walk on two legs as opposed to four. But this paper is particularly interesting because it doesn't propose that we came down to the ground and then stood up. Rather, it proposes that we stood up and then came down to the ground. The title of the paper, which is found open access in Science Advances, is Wild Chimpanzee Behavior Suggests That a Savannah Mosaic Habitat Did Not Support the Emergence of Hominin Terrestrial Bipedalism. So, okay, that's a mouthful. What exactly is it saying? Well, the title of the paper is essentially arguing that by looking at wild chimpanzees, we can make the argument that it wasn't necessarily the reduction in tree cover that forced hominins out of the trees to the ground where they then stood up. This is very interesting because it runs pretty contra to the one thing that most hypotheses about the origins of hominin bipedalism share, which is that whatever happened, its initial trigger was the reduction in tree cover and the transition from forest habitats that chimpanzees primarily still live in today to savanna habitats, which is where we primarily find the fossil hominins. In the abstract, they say, bipedalism, a defining feature of the human lineage, is thought to have emerged as forests retreated in the late Miocene-Pliocene. Chimpanzees living in analogous habitats to early hominins offer a unique opportunity to investigate the ecological drivers of bipedalism that cannot be addressed via the fossil record alone. We investigated positional behavior and terrestriality in the savanna mosaic community of chimpanzees, in the subspecies is Pan troglodytes schweinfurthii, in the Issa Valley, Tanzania, as the first test in a living ape of the hypothesis that wooded savanna habitats were a catalyst for terrestrial bipedalism. Contrary to widely accepted hypotheses of increased terrestriality selecting for habitual bipedalism, results indicate that trees remained an essential component of the hominin adaptive niche, with bipedalism evolving in an arboreal context, likely driven by foraging strategy. So this is really cool, right? They're using living apes as a sort of proxy for how apes in the past might have behaved. Now, I want to kind of put a little asterisk there because using chimpanzees as a sort of stand-in for Miocene apes can be a little bit dangerous, primarily because we don't know which of the Miocene apes is the last common ancestor between us and chimpanzees. Chimpanzees today are quadrupedal knuckle walkers, but it may very well be that the last common ancestor between bipedal humans and knuckle walking quadrupedal chimps was perhaps a suspensory ape or an above branch quadrupedal ape or a careful clamorer. So just put an asterisk there and keep that sort of in the back of your mind as we move forward. With all that being said, this is still very creative because chimpanzees live in a wide range of habitats, which is not really appreciated by the general public. When we think of chimps, we think of them as tree dwellers, right? Or at least jungle dwellers, animals that spend times in these nice lush jungle habitats where they move around in the trees and move around on the ground and swing from branch to branch, which is of course, mostly not what they do, but rather chimpanzees in their actual diversity inhabit a wide range of habitats from like full jungle to sort of a woodland cover to almost savanna environment. So what they're doing in this study is they're looking at the difference in positional and locomotor behavior between chimps in these different habitats. Now, to be clear, locomotor behavior refers to how are they moving, right? Are they quadrupedal on all fours or are they bipedal on two feet? Positional behavior refers to how they're sort of orienting their body. Are they orthograde, upright like humans, or are they pronograde, which is sort of horizontal, like chimpanzees tend to sometimes move, but more accurately describes most quadrupeds, like your dog or your cat, etc., etc. 
The hypothesis they're testing is pretty simple, right? We would expect that chimpanzees that dwell in more open savanna-like habitats, which is what has been typically proposed as the change for ancient hominids, should spend more time on two feet on the ground than the sort of jungle environment chimpanzees or even the woodland environment chimpanzees. That's what we would expect anyways if this was the pressure that drove hominins to first stand and move bipedally. Take away the trees and they must stand upright, as the story very simplistically goes. Okay, so let's see how they make the argument that it isn't actually a sudden change in environment that kind of triggers the evolution of bipedality, and rather it is something else. So in the introduction, as introductions tend to do, it gives us a background on sort of the thinking behind some of these hypotheses and sort of what they're going to do to challenge it or to test it at the very least. They note that obligatory terrestrial bipedalism is a characteristic that is very defining of the hominin clade, so all hominins have adaptations that are bipedal or moving towards that direction. Um, and then they talk about how the primary trigger for this has typically been considered to be open dry habitats, which are called savannas. They note down here that paleoenvironmental reconstructions indicate early hominins were not living in tropical forests common to most extant apes today. So early hominins aren't living in the thick jungles of the Congo or Gabon. Instead, the earliest putative fossil hominins, including Auroran, this is Auroran tugenensis, Ardipithecus, that's Rhamnus and Cadaba, as well as early Australopithecus, likely Australopithecus anamensis is the reference here, would have moved and forged in mosaic savanna habitats dominated by woodland with strips of riparian forest vegetation, often termed savanna woodland or savanna mosaic. And savanna mosaic is what they're going to refer to it from here on out. They note that compared to tropical forest, these savanna mosaic habitats would have elicited different selective pressures, which is of course what we know is the nature of evolution, right? Evolution is sort of environmentally specific, right? Fitness is going to change in the desert versus the Arctic, same here, the, the pressures that are going to allow an organism to survive or push an organism to adapt in certain ways are going to be different in a full jungle versus a full savanna versus something that's kind of a mix. They touch on briefly here why a savanna environment might push more towards bipedalism, and they say savanna mosaics have temporarily and spatially sporadic food sources, as well as greater predatory pressures, and both of these are hypothesized to be selective for bipedalism as a more efficient mode of terrestrial travel. And this is a great hypothesis, right? I think there's a, it has a lot going for it. We know that moving on two feet is more metabolically efficient than moving on four, and that the only reason more animals don't move bipedally is because they kind of have to be predisposed for it. There is a full-scale morphologic shuffle that goes on when you're trying to take something that's a quadruped and move it into being a biped. This is why arboreality is kind of perfect for perceiving bipedality, because something can be orthograde and still an arboreal animal. Take gibbons, for instance. They have a foramen magnum or hole at the base of the skull that is pretty far forward, and we know that their posture is upright, much like humans, and yet they live up in the trees. This is because they are suspensory brachiators. They hang below the branch, and having an upright posture for that is very useful. Put a pin in gibbons, we're going to be talking about them a bit more later. Despite the suggested link between increased terrestriality and the appearance of bipedal adaptations, various lines of evidence support a strong arboreal component in hominin ecology. Fossil hominins show morphological features considered advantageous for arboreal locomotion, such as strong upper limbs, mobile shoulders, elbow and wrist joints, and curved phalanges. This is completely true, and for a long time, people have been pushing for this arboreal retention, right? There's a, a retention of the suite of characteristics that allow hominins to thrive in the trees that kind of pushes late, middle to late in hominin evolution as a whole. Obviously, Lucy species Australopithecus afarensis is known for having the curved phalanges, but even taking it more recent than that, Homo naledi, a hominin that lived 250,000 years ago in our genus, still maintains some of these adaptations that would have made it pretty good in the trees. So clearly there's something going on where it is of the interest of hominins, selectively speaking, at the population level, to not get rid of these characteristics. There's still a fitness use for them. And I wanna take a moment really quickly to apologize if I accidentally use sort of anthropomorphic language here. Obviously organisms don't want to evolve in a certain way. They don't want to retain certain features or get rid of certain features. It's simply a, a way that I'm kind of referring to the selective filter for how organisms are to best fit their given environment. So. 
Just know I'm not applying agency to evolution here. I just sometimes get excited and slip of the tongue, goof it up. So they note here too that these characteristics, as we just mentioned, are not just in early hominins, but also Australopithecus sediba, Homo naledi, and Homo floresiensis. These latter two living as recently as like 60,000 years, Homo floresiensis being the hobbit of Flores. So then they note that in the absence of direct fossil evidence and due to difficulties in reconstructing the relationship between behavior and habitat from morphology alone, Quantitative studies of locomotor ecology of wild extant primates are key to providing valuable insights into how and why bipedalism evolved. Notably, extant apes living in savanna mosaic habitats analogous to those of early hominids provide ideal models to test the savanna effect on apes and by extension hominin behavior. So they're saying kind of what we said at the beginning, right? If we can, we should test the hypotheses relevant to sort of hominin evolution on the closest living analog to humans, which is the members of genus Pan, chimpanzees and bonobos. And what they're going to do is they're going to compare the locomotor and positional repertoire of chimpanzees, Pantrogodites schweinfurtii to be precise, in different environments. And presumably, if there is support for this hypothesis that the environment is what triggers the bipedality to, to kind of be selected for, then we should see hominins living, or rather hominids, these, these chimpanzees, living in the more open savanna environments, spending more time on two feet on the ground than those who are living in the jungle environments. Simple. Okay, so in sort of this first figure here, they're characterizing or mapping out where these chimpanzee communities actually are located on the African continent. We have the Thai community over here in Cote d'Ivoire, Kibali in Uganda, Bwindi in Uganda, Gambe, Mahale, and Isa in Tanzania. And then we close up on the Isa population to sort of map out what the habitat of these chimpanzees looks like. And as you can see, it's a pretty healthy mix of um, woodland, swamp, and rocky outcrops with just this thin vein of forest kind of penetrating into the middle of the territory. And below, we have two pictures of chimpanzees in C and D. So this is what they classify as the open vegetation, and in D, this is our closed vegetation. We have a chimpanzee moving in the open vegetation and in the closed vegetation. Theoretically, again, if this idea of environmental changes triggering bipedalism is a selective pressure, we should see that a chimpanzee in C, environment C here, should move bipedally more often than chimpanzee in environment D. Now for everyone's favorite part, the results section. What did they find? Here they say, terrestriality in a savanna mosaic habitat. We observed 13,743 instantaneous observations of positional bouts from 13 adults, six females, and seven males, including a total of 2,847 observations of locomotor bouts. And this was over the course, for those of you who are wondering, of 15 months. So they were watching these chimps do stuff for a very long time. Okay, so we have some results here in figure two. It's a bar graph. On the x-axis is the chimpanzee community in question, and on the y-axis is our boxes. The boxes themselves represent the percentage of locomotor behavior spent terrestrially or on the ground when they're moving on the ground, and the line is giving us the percentage of all positional behavior spent as locomotion. So 24% of the time, Isa Woodland chimpanzees were moving around, and in the time that they're moving around, the locomotor behavior, 82% of the time, it was on the ground. So right away, we can see that there is a difference in the overall percentage of positional behavior spent moving around. It's higher in the Isa Woodlands, but it's not really that much higher as far as the time spent on the ground. You would think that given these guys are our savanna chimps, they're going to be spending more time on the ground compared to like the Gambier chimpanzees. Um, but we'll, we'll see what they say about that. They go, we then compared ESA behavioral frequencies to published data from chimpanzees living in forest habitats. So they used a lit review to get their non ESA chimpanzee data. For comparative purposes, four sites were considered as closed while savanna mosaic were considered as open based off the dominant vegetation site. As expected, chimpanzees spent more time engaging in locomotion when in an open habitat. So that's true, right? In that 24% is telling us that they're spending more time moving around in an open habitat, probably because resources are more spread out as compared to the chimps at Tai or Kibali or Gombe. Then they say, however, contrary to expectation, the proportion of locomotor time spent terrestrially did not increase with habitat openness. Issa chimpanzees spent less time locomoting on the ground than Thai, Mahale, and Gombe chimpanzees. Issa chimp, chimpanzee terrestriality, excuse me, as well as locomotor behavior most closely resembled that of the densely forested Kibali site. 
So that's exactly what we saw, right? The bar graph tells us that 82% of the time that the uh, ESA woodland chimpanzees are moving around, they're doing so terrestrially. But this is lower than some of the more dense habitats. So what exactly is going on here? This runs contrary to expectations, as the paper said. We should expect, given this idea about hominins and the pressures resulting in their bipedality, that looking at these chimpanzees, the chimps that live in a more open habitat not only should move more often because of the sort of density of their given resources being more spread out, but they should spend more time on the ground than the other chimpanzees. But like, not only did they not spend more time on the ground, it wasn't even equal. They actually spent less time moving terrestrially than chimpanzees living in denser habitats. So what's their idea for what's going on with these chimpanzees and for the pressures leading to bipedalism in ancient hominins? In figure four, they elaborate a little bit more by breaking down the data in a different way. Figure four is titled Chimpanzee Bipedal Locomotion versus Bipedal Posture. So they're comparing bipedal behaviors overall at ESA. So here we have bipedal locomotion where they spent more time being bipedal um, in forest habitats as compared to woodland habitats versus bipedal posture was much more equal. So like bipedal posture wasn't seemingly dependent on the environment, but bipedal locomotion may have been. At least that's what I'm getting. They say bipedal behaviors at ESA showing overall percentage of bipedal posture versus bipedal locomotion with each broken down to show the use of bipedalism in the forest um, versus the woodland. Bipedalism was mainly a postural behavior at ESA with 75% of all bipedal observations being postural. Although postural bipedalism does not differ between vegetation types, there was a trend towards more bipedal locomotion in the forest. So this is kind of like the opposite of what the the hypothesis with regard to hominins has proposed, right? They should be moving bipedally more when they're on the ground in these sort of woodland or savanna environments as opposed to the forest. So the discussion is really cool. Let's sort of appreciate some of the sections of the discussion together. And then I want to give kind of my thoughts on this whole thing and what it means for the evolution of bipedalism sort of in a larger context of hominins. So they note that their investigation here was kind of the first test in a living ape of the hypothesis that arid and open environments of the late Miocene and Pliocene acted as a catalyst for hominin terrestrial bipedalism. They're right. To my knowledge, this hadn't been tested before on any living apes. Variation in the ESA chimpanzee positional behavior indicates that terrestriality and bipedalism do not increase within more open habitats and instead offer support for hominin bipedalism evolving within an arboreal context. So that's kind of the underscored point there, right? Bipedalism certainly evolved in hominins and this paper provides support that it happened in the trees and then hominins came to the ground already bipedal. So they talked for a little bit about why the chimpanzees here at ESA might sort of have hashed out this way. They see that ESA chimps increase their terrestriality overall in woodland vegetation as compared to the forest, reflecting the importance of vegetation structure on ape substrate use during locomotion. So they spent more time moving around on the ground in open habitats as opposed to the forest, at least at ESA. However, they note that ESA chimpanzees were no more terrestrial in woodland vegetation than chimpanzees living in the forest habitat, suggesting that it is not a simple rule of less trees means more time on the ground. Um, they talk a little bit about why these specific chimpanzees might sort of have, have fallen out the way they did in comparison to the other communities, sort of in reference to um, how they forage in living in a more seasonal environment. Uh, but the part that's kind of interesting, I think, for our purposes is the hominin arboreal niche. They say our results challenge the long held association between increased stress reality and the evolution of locomotor bipedalism in early hominins. Whereas previous hypotheses founded on observations of wild chimpanzees have indeed acknowledged the role of arboreal feeding as a driver of bipedal posture, they posit bipedal locomotion evolving as a terrestrial behavior in a more open habitat. Issa chimpanzees remained highly arboreal and did not use more bipedalism in open vegetation. Instead, they used more arboreal locomotor bipedalism than forest dwelling chimpanzees, lending support to bipedal locomotion emerging and evolving as an arboreal adaptation in early hominins. Combined with the fact that bipedalism was predominantly used while foraging on terminal branches at ESA, we further suggest that highly productive, wide canopy feeding trees favor arboreal locomotor bipedalism to safely navigate flexible terminal branches to reach food and remain safe from terrestrial predators in an open habitat. 
This hypothesis is also consistent with the use of bipedal locomotion by orangutans on flexible branches. So hold on, let's break that down. So when on the ground, the Issa chimpanzees, which live in a habitat that is most analogous to ancient hominins, didn't spend more time being bipedal as compared to the forest chimpanzees. This was very confusing, but it has an interesting explanation as the authors just pointed out. The savannah chimpanzees spent way more time being bipedal than the forest chimpanzees in an arboreal context. So they stood upright to feed in the trees as compared to the forest chimpanzees. So why might that be? Well, the authors argued that it's because in this ancient savanna habitat, just like today, there's an enormous risk of predators when you're on the ground. So you want to spend as much time in any given tree patch, despite the fact that they're spread out, as possible. As a result, you want to be able to get as much out of the tree as you can, including the fruiting bodies that are at the terminal ends of branches. Branches that you can't get to when you're on all fours. You need to stand up and get as many contact points as possible you have to have an orthograde posture. They sum it up quite nicely in this sentence that we've already read, right? Combined with the fact that bipedalism was predominantly used while foraging on terminal branches, those are the distal ends, the far away ends of branches, at ESA, we further suggest that highly productive, productive, wide canopy feeding trees favor arboreal bipedalism to safely navigate flexible terminal branches to reach foods and remain safe from terrestrial predators in an open habitat. Um, that's really cool. And then they note that this is very interesting because orangutans also do it. So it seems to be a, a common response to avoiding coming down to the ground is adapting a, a bipedal locomotion to safely get at the fruits that you perhaps couldn't get to uh, as a quadruped. So they go on to say hominin arboreality is consistent with dental microware and food mechanical properties of hominins before 4 million years ago, showing a C3 rich diet that is similar to those of extant savanna mosaic chimpanzees. So what they're saying is this is a great hypothesis and it also matches the diets. It seems like early hominins, things like Aurora and Tugenensis and the members of Artipithecus and early members of Australopithecus were eating the same stuff that these savanna chimpanzees are eating today, suggesting that they might have been exploiting similar niches and thus maybe these hominins were doing the same thing as chips. They say, um, Issa chimpanzee positional behavior therefore provides a model for how early hominins have, could have maintained a C3 rich diet in a savanna mosaic habitat, foraging arboreally at equal if not more frequent rates to forest conspecifics to effectively harvest abundant but spatially restricted food sources and to counterbalance energy loss through increased travel distances between widely distributed food patches. Okay, let's wrap it up. They see, we suggest that ecological heterogeneity would have provided one, important foods across the increasingly seasonal environment and two, the selective pressures that promote and explain the presence and persistence of hominin postcranial functional morphology advantageous for bipedal and arboreal locomotion. The high frequency of arboreal behavior in open vegetation combined with the high frequency of bipedal locomotion at ESA provides insight into two long-standing debates in paleoanthropology. Number one, that bipedalism evolved as an arboreal locomotor behavior before being accepted or sort of reused for a terrestrial context, and two, that the arboreal features retained in many early and even late hominins living in open habitats were functionally significant and adaptive. Life in the trees was likely an essential component of the hominin adaptive niche, even as forests retreated. So, I think this is a really cool paper. It's the first one to kind of take a, a hominid locomotor hypothesis and apply it to a population of wild living chimpanzees, at least to my knowledge, it is. And what they showed is very interesting indeed. It's support for the idea that bipedalism evolved in an arboreal context for the purposes of foraging. This was kind of an on the edge idea, mostly just because it didn't have any concrete support for it, although people have proposed it in the past. But mainly what I think is compelling about this idea is that it explains a lot of the features that we see in hominins, right? It explains why even though Australopithecus, a genus that is predominantly bipedal in its morphology, right, still retains arboreal aspects to it, the curved phalanges and the highly mobile shoulder. Moreover, it explains why this persists even late into hominins because there is still this adaptive benefit to having um, arboreal sort of tools at hand. I mean, in a morphologic context, to be clear. Um, it's a cool paper. It's really interesting. Um, but I do have a few thoughts that make me a bit 
wary. For me, it primarily boils down to using chimpanzees as our stand-in for the last common ancestor of chimps and humans. It is probable, in my opinion, that the last common ancestor, this Miocene ape, didn't move like chimpanzees or humans. I think it was probably suspensory, or I guess it could be an above-branch quadruped. Now, don't get me wrong, the idea still holds, right? Foraging can still be a motivation for that bipedal uh, locomotion up in the trees to maintain points of stability, and of course for maintaining the orthograde posture that evolved beforehand. However, what this paper seems to be showing is that even if you change the environment for something that is bipedal and orthograde in the trees, it doesn't stay orthograde and bipedal on the ground. And I kind of think that that's because we're using a chimpanzee here, right? A chimpanzee is more predisposed towards being orthograde and bipedal than say um, a, a colobus monkey, right? But something like a gibbon might be a better analog here because when gibbons do come to the ground, even though they spend the vast majority of their time in the trees, they are still bipedal. It may have to do with the location of the foramen magnum position and angle, right? So chimpanzees have a sort of intermediate foramen magnum, and that might be why when they come down to the ground, it's just easier to fall onto all fours again. And that might be um, due to like phylogenetic inertia, right? They've just evolved primarily in a context that facilitates that, that terrestrial quadrupedalism on their knuckles. Or something like a gibbon, which stays upright in the trees and bipedal in the trees, comes down to the ground, stays bipedal, its foramen magnum is actually far more forward. So I think this works as a really good tentative model or a sort of kind of analog for what hominins might have been doing. It's a great proof of concept. However, I think to really flesh it out more, we need to know more about the template we're working with, right? The hominin that came before and how that body plan is going to respond to the environment around it. How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we need some more fossils, I think. But second of all, I think we can still apply the ideas here. We just have to be careful. Anyways, my apologies for a kind of rambly video. I wanted to get something out there that was a little bit more scientific, and I thought this was a cool paper to cover. However, I have complicated feelings on it, and I'm not 100% sure that I've totally sorted out how I feel about the work as a whole. So. I'm going to keep milling around on that. And in the meantime, my gentle, of course, very modern apes, please do take care of yourselves.